सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली मॉर्निंग आई डिड दूसुअल थिंग विच इज टेकिंग ऑफ दई पैड एंड लॉगिंग ऑन टू माई फेवरेट न्यूज वेबसाइट मोस्टली दूस पेपर आई रीड ऑनलाइन and then i also logged on to twitter uh, and i discovered something surprising was trending in the morning early morning by my standards now you know what there is a friend of mine and i and we say there is a wrong allegation on us that we start our day late we wake up late or we sleep late we work 9 to 9 but sort of greenwich mean time like london time uh, so i don't wake up early when i did wake up i found that this surprising trend was Ajit Doval. Like what's happened with Ajit Doval? And I saw tens of thousands of tweets in that name, uh, with that hashtag. Like what's happened with Ajit Doval? And then I checked and realized that this is Mr. Doval's seventy-seventh birthday. So many happy returns, Mr. Doval. You have a lot of work to do. Stay well. Stay happy. Stay active. Importantly, it also occurred to me. that this is also the death anniversary of r and cow who is by any definition the most famous the most successful spy master in india's history it is on this date that he passed away at the age of 83 so this coincidence i thought was a good opportunity to talk about the business of intelligence gathering spying operations in 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 the history of independent india and some key figures who featured there now ajit doval is present right there he is india's national security advisor he is also among our most operationally oriented national security advisors so how many national security advisors have we had the position was created by the vajpayee government so brijesh mishra the first nsa he was a foreign service officer he was as you would expect more oriented towards foreign policy less military and less intelligence but he also was principal secretary to prime minister so he combined the two jobs so a lot of his time and mind space went into governance issues and running the pmo as well so he did a lot of the environment control for the prime minister that the principal secretary has to do so that was a hybrid role after that when the upa came into power they thought that this role was too wide nsa and that then just as india has two intelligence agencies intelligence bureau for domestic intelligence and raw research and analysis wing for external intelligence they should also have two nsas one looking after internal security that had to that became mr mk narayanan former ips officer also of the kerala cadre just like ajit doval and for external issues they had jn dikshit who was the former indian foreign secretary also india's ambassador to many key countries particularly in the neighborhood in the course of time mr dikshit passed away he died in harness and then mk narayanan continued in this job mk narayanan was a former intelligence bureau chief as well and also known as quite an institution builder for the ib and also for the nsa's office so he did his job in very difficult times also uh, many many important events took place at that time many challenges came up at that time after him upa had shiv shankar menon who again was an ifs officer so it started ifs went ifs plus ips then became ifs and since then since nda has come in we've had mr ajit doval a former ips officer 1968 batch of the kerala cadre now even before this in 2004 when upa had come to power he was appointed director of intelligence bureau so he's somebody who's worked across governments and who's been trusted across governments now as often happens lots of stories get built around people 
in the spooky business. So a lot of stories have got built around Ajit Doval as well. So, so I did write a national interest piece uh, headline, if I remember correctly, that Do the Doval detail in 2016, talking about many of these things. Now, in his case, a lot of a lot of stories have spread that he was undercover in Pakistan for seven years. He did this. He did that. He's like projected like an Indian Desi De James Bond. Now, if you want to use that parallel. James Bond, I might say that he is the most Khurafati of Indian intelligence, senior intelligence people. Most Khurafati in the sense that he is the most operations oriented. So if that is your definition of James Bond, then during the period that he was James Bond in the intelligence bureau, he also had an M. You know, James Bond has a boss called M and that M more often than not was M.K. Narayanan. So they also worked in tandem <coughs> on many occasions. Now the fact is that with Ajit Doval, I have had a career, a journalistic career running sort of conquering, concurrently. Although he's a bit older. Now as happens in our lives as reporters, usually people we interact with are a little bit older than us because they are more senior in the government, they have more information and they also are taken more seriously for the more important jobs. In the government, nobody is taken so seriously if you are too young. So uh, there were many places where his tenures and my reporting years coincided. And there were many where I just preceded him. So my first visit to Mizoram in January of 1981 was when he had recently left Mizoram as the head of the subsidiary intelligence bureau there. It used to be the position of an assistant director those days. And Brigadier Tenfunga Silo, who was the chief minister of Mizoram and a former brigadier in the Indian Army, he said to me that, look, over a long sort of session, because he thought that I was a young reporter and he would he would make me understand the Northeast Mizoram better. And he said, you know, do you know a man called Ajit Gobal? I said, no. And he said, if your government had a few more intelligence officers like him, Northeast would not be in such a mess. So I did hear of his fame that early on. Then not long after, the former Chogyal of Sikkim passed away. His name, if I may remind you, was Palden Thonduk Namgyal. I'm saying former Chogyal because Mrs. Gandhi in 1975, when she merged Sikkim with India, she abolished the office and title of the Chogyal. So he died. And I had gone to cover the funeral in Gangtok. I used to then cover the Northeast for Indian Express. So I'd gone to Gangtok, my first visit to Gangtok. And people told me, oh, there was a very sharp IB officer here called Ajit Doval, who's just gone back. Once again, I sort of followed just after he had left a place and heard of his reputation. Then when I joined India today in 1983 and came to Delhi, among the first stories I was asked to cover was the trouble in Punjab. That's when Bindra Wale was sitting in the Golden Temple. And that is when we figured that Mr. Doval was now in Pakistan in our mission. He was not undercover. He was a diplomat in our mission. He was only undercover to the extent that I think his title was something like counselor, commercial and trade. And there wasn't very much commerce and trade between India and Pakistan at any point of time. He was also tracking very closely. He was doing what he was doing, but he was also tracking very closely. The Sikh Jathas used to go for their pilgrimages to their holy places in Pakistan. And, and one of those visits, because he was escorting the Jatha, somebody leaked his identity. And I think he was also roughed up a little bit, which was very unfortunate. But it was still an act of bravery to be there, even if you were not undercover. And we know what happened after that. After that, once he came back from Pakistan, back to IB, he again got involved in operations. He had a key role to play in 1988, Operation Black Thunder in the Golden Temple, which saw for the first time the use of National Security Guards, the new anti-terrorism force, and also saw KPS Gill rise to national prominence. Until then, he was well known in Assam because he'd been, he'd been IG law and order there in difficult times, but, but not so much in Punjab yet. He was from Assam cadre. Now, the interesting thing is that 
after that this collaboration between him and ajit dobal carried on for quite some time and when the third phase of punjab insurgency came which was the most violent of all phases the most violent was not bindra bale's phase most violent was the third phase when in a year 1990 91 about 15000 people were killed overall it was during that phase between say 1991 to 1993 when narsi marao had come into power and he gave a card blanche to kps gill <laughs> that is when <clears throat> punjab terrorism was wiped out and, and i have written in the past and i'll say again that almost all this sort of a category terrorists were then divided in a b c categories a means the worst of the lot almost all the a category terrorists who were killed or captured was a case of bold doval caught gill or you could reverse it bold dil gill caught doval because they worked in tandem like that so so that's where these reputations were built but institutionally ib itself has had many formidable figures this is one of the most formidable and most controversial uh, who also left a very controversial legacy was b n malik m u l l i k that's how the name was spelled he was a bengali Now Bholanath Malik, as his name was, he became the chief of IB in 1950. He became the chief of my of IB on July 15, 1950, and carried on until October 19, 1964. So that's almost 15 years. So his tenure in the IB was almost co-terminus with Jawaharlal Nehru. We know that in May of 1964, Jawaharlal Nehru passed away. and the same year b n malik also demoted office or retired now b n malik why did he become controversial he became controversial because at that time the war with china took place in 1962 india had only one intelligence agency and that was intelligence bureau there was no raw and it was then believed that intelligence bureau had failed to give advance or adequate warning to the government of what was going to happen or maybe that the intelligence bureau had underestimated the threat from the chinese now the second part i am willing to buy the first i am not willing to buy because it is only because bn malik and ib had seen the chinese territorial threat that they had supported and advanced the idea of the of the forward policy that is in all the areas which india claimed but india did not have presence and nobody had presence india claimed and china claimed but nobody had presence forward policy was keep moving ahead one step at a time and establishing posts of army or paramilitary forces or even crpf to say that we are here right like planting the flag that was forward policy what bn malik and ib went wrong on in their estimation of what the chinese response will be they kept on thinking that the chinese despite these provocations will look the other way and never resort to a full fledged conflict that is where we went, they went wrong and that is what has sort of muddied his legacy after that and that is also what then created the debate for an external intelligence agency and that's why raw came into being it did not come into being immediately after bn malik passed away because india was still going was still going through a very fraught period 1965 our next one and a half war took place one with the pakistan the 22 day war the monsoon war as it's called but just before that also half a war in kutch that is called the kutch conflict so india did not have breathing space but after 65 raw came in a bn malik was also from the school of scholar civil servants he was from ip or what was earlier called imperial indian police that is british police later it just came to be called ip like indian police because once india became independent who was going to call it uh, imperial so it became ip so ip is the predecessor of the ips he was an ip officer of the 1932 cadre <clears throat> 1950 he became chief before that for 2 years the first indian chief of the ib again it's a, it's a name that nobody remembers now was mr tg sanjeevi pillai he was the ib chief from april 
to July 1950 when B. N. Malik took over. B. N. Malik was also very close to Nehru personally, and some of that comes out in the three books that he's written. So he's written this very impressive trilogy, and that's why I say that officers, civil servants of those periods were also quite scholarly, uh, like the British officers writing gazetteers and writing their memoirs. They wrote a lot of good stuff. So B. N. Malik wrote. A set of three books. That's his life's work. All three were called My Years with Nehru, Volume One, Two, and Three. And these volumes were all published in 1971. And these were called Volume One was the Chinese Betrayal. So that is obviously an explanation or his explanation of what went wrong in 1962. Volume Two was Kashmir, My Years with Nehru, Kashmir. So that is the entire history of Kashmir, starting early on. that is when the maharaja of jammu and kashmir signed the instrument of accession and then all the relationship the complex relationship with sheikh abdullah and the ups and downs it went through in fact when we mention that we also have to mention another unsung name that is colonel is hasan walia who was the ib station head in shrinagar at that point and in some ways he was responsible to bring for bringing nehru and sheikh abdullah together and also for their break up subsequently bin bin malik talks about all this that happened in kashmir all the cloak and daggers and smoke and mirrors in volume 2 of my years with nehru volume 3 is simple my years with nehru 1948 1964 these were published by allied publications in 1971 these are all out of print and fortunately it is it is very unfortunate i wish these are all digitized so all of some of digitized in fact you can read some pages here and there but not in as structured a manner as i would wish them to be but if you can source them in a library please check these out now the first head of raw was mr r n kao whose death anniversary it happens to be today mr r n kao who's again become a storied life in india there's lots and lots of stories some myths some reality about him we know the stellar stellar role he played in 1971 that famous or if you are in pakistan then in famous hijack of an indian airlines fokker friendship aircraft by kashmiri quote and quote militants which then became the reason for india to ban pakistan aircrafts over flights over the indian territory into east pakistan that just made connectivity so difficult for west pakistan because then they had to fly all the way around it just became too difficult for them but for that india had to find an excuse and that excuse was the hijack of that aircraft so in protest against that that our plane was hijacked by kashmiri militants linked to you and the plane was blown up etc we will not allow you over flights that was an intelligence operation one of ross most successful operations after that also there was a lot there's a lot that's been said there's a lot that's not been said for example how ins vikrant was taken away from vizag it was taken to the andamans because somebody knew that pns ghazi the submarine was coming looking for it and how then pns ghazi was sunk off vizag all these are stories which have not been fully detailed remain a little bit in the gray area but you can see that all these involved not just the armed forces but also intelligence operative so that was mr t v rajeshwar's fame and by the way since we are talking about couple of these officers who come from imperial indian police the earlier service i must also tell you that another famous name famous author who we quote and read all the time george orwell he also worked he was also an officer in imperial indian police in fact he served in what is myanmar now between 1922 and 1927 it's just that if you googled his name in the records of indian police service or imperial indian police you will never find it because george orwell was his acquired name later like a pen name his real name under which he served in imperial indian police was eric blair although if you ask me that eric blair sounds like more, a more likely pseudonym than george orwell now there are lots of other people the tragedy is with intelligence business that operatives who actually go undercover and who take risks who sometimes spend lifetimes in hostile jails go through painful trials torture interrogation 
and also lose their lives they are almost never remembered so we know the stories a little bit about sarabjit singh for example sujit singh these are people who my colleague and our national security editor now praveen swami tells me carried out up to 86 covert operations in pakistan we have no memory for them no memorial for them that is most unlike say what happens in israel israel the mossad headquarters itself has a memorial for its own agents who who've done stellar work or made sacrifices in the line of duty in india we do no such thing because even when these people came back even if they are released as part of an exchange or whatever they are just allowed to be forgotten and that needs to be rectified now having said that i will mention a few more names before before i let you go because it's rare that we get a chance to talk about these things so there was pn banerji who was joint director of intelligence bureau in the late 60s and then he was seconded out or sent out on deputation to raw he played a key role a stellar role in forming the mukti bahini again you will not hear very much about him the best spies go unsung unfortunately there was also major general sujit singh pabban we spoke about that when we did a full katta clutter on special frontier force the tibetan covert force that india launched that india launched in 1962 just after the war and the troops from which were used in indian army's kalash range expedition or kalash kalash range movement that surprised the chinese in august of 2020 Major General Goban was the founder of SFF. He also became very closely and keenly involved with Mukti Bayani operations, along with P. N. Banerjee. Then Anand Verma. Anand Verma is a raw chief who people of my generation also knew. He was a raw chief under Rajiv Gandhi when the great tension over Operation Brass Tax, Exercise Brass Tax took place. But he is also the first Indian intelligence chief. to establish a covert contact with his pakistani counterpart and that is something that he wrote about in an article in the hindu uh, and something that i mentioned also in an article which i'll share with you when hamid gul passed away hamid gul the infamous isi chief of the 80s so they established a covert connection they met overseas in europe that connection was brokered or or facilitated by the jordanians jordanians as you know were very friendly jordanian royal family was very friendly with rajiv gandhi also and jordan's crown prince his wife came from pakistan and crown prince prince hasan then was very friendly with rajiv gandhi that's when that interesting thing took place when jordan gifted a couple of cars to rajiv gandhi to use in the prime minister's office and india allowed royal jordanian airways landing rights in india so that is that is the complex history everything is linked to everything and everything ultimately leads to national security in all these stories then you have girish gary saxena chief of raw so between being chief of raw and governor of kashmir for long spells he spent a lifetime dealing with the kashmir issue his brother by the way uh, naresh chandra naresh chandra was cabinet secretary uh, he was Home Secretary of India at one time, Gary Saxena was Governor in Kashmir, and <coughs> Naresh Chandra was Home Secretary in Delhi. He was also Ambassador to America, and later he was also the custodian in many different ways of India's nuclear program and a key figure in the Pokhran two tests. So these two brothers sort of were the Grand Viziers of Indian national security for a very long time. there were others there were others who are barely remembered now arvind dave do you remember arvind dave was the chief of raw when the war in kargil took place now if i reminded you that when the war in kargil took place india's trump card was those tapes those audio tapes of the phone conversation of the tapped phone conversation between general musharraf who was then in beijing and one of his deputies and that's when they were saying oh these are our boys एवरीबडी हमें क्या पता हम तो उनको मुजाहिद ही नहीं बोलेंगे एक्सेट्रा एंड देर डिस्कसिंग अच्छा एक आज मी सेवनटीन गिर गया आज एक फलाना गिर गया इन दोज कॉन्वर्सेशन दोज टैप्ड कॉन्वर्सेशन टेन एक्सपोज द पाकिस्तानी परफिडी एंड डूअल गेम टू द होल वर्ल्ड एंड स्ट्रेंथन इंडियाज मॉरल पोजिशन 
so somebody eavesdropped on that conversation and picked those up that had to be raw at that time so arvind dave was then the head of raw later he became after retiring he was appointed governor of arunachal and then briefly governor of meghalaya since then i have also lost track of him but once again as i told you there are many who go unsung and they carry out operations that do india a great deal of good for example once again 2008 one of the big pluses for indian intelligence and security agencies was that they were able to eavesdrop on those on those phone conversations that terrorists were having with their controllers back home or what the hindi news channels call their aka back back home and also that through those sim cards that those terrorists were using india was able to nail the fact that they were pakistanis those sim cards had been planted in a in a covert operation by a jammu and kashmir police officer on lashkar e taiba people if those sim cards had not been pla- planted by him then we would not have been able to crack that mystery so soon and also handle it so effectively and also pakistan would not have drawn such immediate global opprobrium as they did the name of that officer because again nobody will remind you of it was mukhtar sheikh so too many people in this business also go unsung